questions? Welcome. This is Senior English B, and today we are scheduled to speak of the great poet John Keats. Uh, we have asked already two questions that you are looking at, uh, uh, as well as you are looking at page 860. Uh, question one, Keats, before he dies, writes down the language that he wants on his tombstone. Here lies one whose name was writ in water. We'll be hearing from Mr. Duran in a moment as to exactly what that means. Secondly, the question is a 3B question. If you knew you weren't going to live beyond the end of October, and as I pointed out, there are individuals right now who are receiving that information. They're not sitting in a classroom. They're rather inside some office where some physician of sorts is saying, yeah, it's not going to happen. Sorry, it's just not going to happen. It's one thing to die suddenly. Would you agree with me? Unexpectedly suddenly. That's one thing. But the Keats story is a different story. He knew he was going, and he knew he didn't have long to live. He knew that, for reasons that we'll explain in a second. If you knew that you didn't have long to live, what would you want to have on your own tombstone? Of course, let's be fair. Most individuals have words on their tombstone after they go. They didn't put them there. Someone who loved them or took care of them or whatever put those words there. Sometimes, though, individuals actually say, when I go, I want this on my tombstone. Now, let's be fair. That might change for you over the course of years. Keats was roughly your age when he discovered he soon must go. Or as he says it in his classic sonnet, when I have fears that I may cease to be. That is to say, when I'm afraid I'm going to go. So, Mr. Durant, give us some insight. What does it mean to say, here lies one whose name was written water? When you go to a swimming pool with a <coughs> stick and there's water in the pool and you write your name in the water, you try and make a mark. You can see that the mark has been made in the water, yes? What happens to the mark that's been made in the water? As soon as, soon as you make the mark, where does the mark go? Gone, right? Gone. So now jot down. I've helped you a bit more, haven't I, Mr. Ramos? Mm -hmm. Why would a poet say in advance of his death, here lies one whose name was writ in water? Mr. Durant, you want to take a guess at this? Why would a poet say that? What was Keats already assuming about fame for himself? He would never achieve it. Never achieve it. This is huge. He never achieved it. This kid dies, and he was a kid. Let's point that out. How old was he when he died? You're right? This kid's roughly five years older than you when he goes. When he dies, the assumption by him is no one will ever remember me. Now, if that was the assumption by him, it certainly would have been the assumption by anybody else around him. Keats had not yet produced enough work for anyone to believe he would achieve any modicum of fame. Here lies one whose name was written water. Now let's finish the story. If right now you got on a plane and went to any university English department in the world, let's say you just got on a plane went to Melbourne and asked the uh, university literature department there, the readers, the professors there, name the top five poets of all time in the English language. Top five. Of course, yes, Shakespeare will always be there, no doubt. After Shakespeare, it starts to become a debate as to the greatest poets in the English language. But guess who always ends up in the top five? This cat. This cat. Doesn't matter who you ask. Doesn't, I mean, if you, if you look at any list of the five greatest poets, Keats will always be there. Now, where he'll be there after Shakespeare is usually almost always one. Where he'll be there is always a huge debate. Right? Is he two? Is he five? But he's almost always in the top five. The irony, of course, is that he dies believing he will never even be remembered. Let's talk about Keats's biography for just a moment. Keats lives in a London 
And the city of London is an interesting town. It's got a, it's got a, uh, it's kind of like in a bowl type of thing, where there's, uh, where it kind of recessed, uh, and the way they heated, and the way they cooked was with coal, pure coal, black coal. You just cook this way with it, which is no big deal if it's you on the mountain alone. But when you add it to London thousands and thousands of people all cooking at the same time, the smoke becomes so intense that there are times in London's history when in the middle of the day they have to light all the street lamps because nobody can see where they're going because this coal smoke is so thick. People literally think of it as being in the middle of the night and it's noon. Well, the problem, of course, is not so much what you can't see but rather what you're breathing in. So you have this problem that they will call consumption, we will call it tuberculosis, fundamentally it's your lungs which are really precious tissue, which is why it's so asinine to put smoke inside of those lungs, right? Of any kind, certainly cigarette smoke is the epitome of stupidity, right? Um, because your lungs are nothing more than tissue. If I could right now take your lungs out of your chest and hold them in front of you, you would immediately recognize they look like a sponge. Soft, very, very delicate material. And that's what makes those that, that your lungs so precious to you. As you age, anything that you're breathing in is filtered through those lungs, and those lungs can begin to deteriorate. When you are breathing in lots of coal smoke, you ain't going to live for very long. And what happens is, in Keats's family, this, this happens to more than one person, where you've got this problem of the lungs start becoming infected. Now, the way you knew that you had consumption was if you started coughing and blood came out of your mouth. When that happened, and usually men would carry around some kind of a hanky or a bandana or whatever, and, we, <coughs> and when blood splattered on the hanky, you knew it was done. It was over. Because once your lungs start bleeding, in Keats's day, there's nothing to be done. All you basically do is wait to die. Now, there was some hope of a remedy if you could get away from London, which is why often people would leave the city and go elsewhere. The other thing I should point out is that London and England very damp. So damp, it's a damp culture. So once your lungs start getting screwed up, this, this moisture can also screw with you. And it makes it very, anybody that has any kind of asthma <coughs> issues knows what I'm talking about when I say how hard it is to breathe. Keats's solution, anybody read the biography to know what he did? What did he do? Where'd he go? Italy. He did, he went to Rome. And uh, why would he go there, Harder? What would be the point in going there? A, a city that I'm gonna recommend all of you visit at some point, it's quite lovely. Yeah, it's a climate that sits right on the Mediterranean where you have weather that's kind of like our weather. When I, when I once took a group of students to Rome, they pointed out that the weather there was very similar to the weather of Worland. Always sunshiny, and there was always this nice breeze in the morning. The only difference is in Rome, you're very close to the ocean as well. So Keats will go there. Today, you can visit right there next to those very famous steps, the, the room where Keats uh, died. He, he didn't live, he, he died there, it didn't save his life. He was writing poetry the night before he died, actually. Right up until the end of his life, he was writing poetry. However, nobody thought his poetry was any good. The, you know those guys that do thumbs up, thumbs down for movies? There were those kinds of people in Keats's day, only they did thumbs up, thumbs down for poems. And all of those guys said his poetry isn't any good. Let's just say it for your notes. Keats was way ahead of his time. But he definitely fits within the Romantic tradition. Now let's go back over ground real quickly. Remember the Romantic writers of the English period, starting with what year? It's an easy round figure for us, isn't it? 1800, yeah, 1800. When we talk 1800 England, we're talking about the time of the Romantics. Remember, we divide them into two generations. The first generation, remember, those, old, those older writers, we uh, always think of, of course, who? In that, in that generation one family. We always think of the guy who wrote 
The world is too much with us, laden soon, getting and spending, right? Wordsworth, you'll remember. His pal Coldridge, who wrote Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. We always fit there. And then that second generation of writers, remember, we have those three young guns, two of which we've already talked about. In order, who are they? Byron, Byron and Shelley. We now come to the third. And in many ways, he's the most enigmatic. All three of those guys, enigmatic, mysterious. We don't know a lot about it. Um, all three of those guys, think about it. They all three die young. Byron dies young. Shelley dies young. Remember how Shelley died. He drowns. What did I say was in his pocket when they pulled him out of the water? A collection of the poetry of John Keats. Shelley knew. The poets of his own time kind of knew. It would take a long time later for people to pick up the slender volume to get all of Keats's collective works is a small, small volume. I mean, everything he ever wrote, you can put in one small volume. And yet today, considered one of the five greatest poets that ever lived in the English language. Phenomenal. Well, now, what makes this guy so remarkable? Well, let's start with his classic sonnet, one that I suggest that you give some small t time to memorize. When I have fears that I may cease to be. Let's take a look at this poem. Let's analyze it. And then we'll work at 3B, because, hello, let's remind ourselves, we're doing two things concurrently. One, of course, we're trying to improve as readers, no doubt. We want to be a little bit better readers when we finish in May than we are now, no doubt. But two, we want to read something that challenges us to think differently, to see the world a little bit differently. Some of you already had that realization this morning when I asked if this was your last October, what would you want on your tombstone? But now I'm going to ask a different question. If some doctor told you that you would be gone in May, that the tumor on your brain, we can pretty much sustain you until May of next year. It gives you 150 days to live. Write down on your paper real quickly, what would you do? And try to prioritize real quickly. If I told you, you would be gone in May, and you pretty much believe me because I had enough degrees to tell you that when I look at your brain, I can tell you, you're not going to make it. By May, you will be gone. But we can sustain the quality of your life enough that you can do a few things still. What would it be for you? What would be the number one thing that you would say you'd want to do? What would be the number two thing that you would say you'd want to do? Jot them down real quickly. You can be general, that is to say... There's someone I would want to meet. Or you could be specific. That is to say, I would like to shake someone's and then name that person's hand. You can say, general, I'd like to travel. Or you can be specific. I'd like to stand inside of the Sistine Chapel and breathe that really dusty, musty air that's in there. See? Okay? So jot down. What would it be for you? And see, already some of you are saying, dude, I'm not even 20 why would I be thinking about what I want to do before I die? Let's be fair. That's right. That's right. When you're young, you don't think about the fact that someday you're not going to be young or you even won't be here. But Keats had to because he started coughing up blood. He got the note from the doctor. The doctor told him, yeah, this ain't going to be long. It's going to be, it's going to be very short and then you're gone. When we listen to Keats in his poem, we're going to see what was on his mind. Right? What's, what was on his mind? Uh, by the way, certainly your list ought to include some kind of travel, we would say, to see some part of the world. And even if that's not on your list, do it now. What are the three places in the world you want to see before you die? Name them specifically. What cities or what towns or what geographic sites? Is there any place you want to see before you go? Or are you content to simply live in Worland for the rest of your life? See? All right? By the way, I should point out, one or two of you will elect to travel and then you'll say, you know, Worland's not a bad place to come back to after you've seen the world. It's kind of a nice place to be from and then to come back to. When I have fears, I'm, on, uh, I'm with you now on 862. When I have fears that I may cease to be before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high-piled books and character hold like rich garners the full ripened grain. When I behold upon the night's starred face huge cloudy symbols of a high romance, 
and think that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance. And when I feel, fair creature of an hour, that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love, then on the shore of the wide world I stand alone and think till love and fame to nothingness do sink. Let's point out what it is. By the way, I should just point out a 2B real quickly. Notice, first of all, this is a sonnet. Do you see it? 14 lines, right? Just like the world is too much with us late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers was a sonnet. These romantic poets, they'll play the game of sonnet writing. The poet that makes sonnet writing the most famous at 2B, you might write it down. I've already mentioned his name, and it's the reason he's considered the greatest poet in the English language is, of course, who? You're right, Shakespeare. And we'll, and we'll hit Shakespeare when we get into the second semester. See, technically, we would be studying this material sometime in April, <clears throat> right? Because we would do the first part of the book this semester, and then we would be into this part of the book in the second semester. Does that make sense? Sometime around April, right? We would normally be studying this. And by that point, we would have already studied the sonnets of Shakespeare so we could understand all of the Romantic poets, and this is important for your notes, all of them, Wordsworth, Byron, Shelley, Keats, all of them celebrated Shakespeare as the greatest poet. So, for example, Keats said nobody will ever be able to equal Shakespeare, right? So, along with Milton, we should probably say in that list of the greatest of the English poets. Um, they all, they all, the Romantic poets like to play the game of sonnet writing. Notice 14 lines. Oh, do you see a rhyme scheme here? B rhymes with character. Brain rhymes with grain. Do you see it? Right? So we have in rhyme, don't we? But take a look at the rhythm of the lines. When I have fears that I may cease to be before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain is the way we read it. But if we want to scan it, S-C-A-N, if we want to scan it, we slow it down. When I have fears that I may cease to be before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain. Look at it again. When I have fears that I may cease to be before my pen has gleaned my teeth and brain. Watch me. When I have fears that I may cease to be. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. That ba -bum is what we call an iambic foot of poetry. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Right? When I do five of those, the Greek word for five is pent, pentameter. So I've got iambic, ba -bum, ba -bum, five of them. Iambic pentameter, and notice the entire poem. Till love and fame to nothingness to saint. Right? See, I can read the entire poem that way, but now we're going to talk about what the poem actually means. Finally, though, before we even get there, let's make sure we understand. This is a, uh, and Shakespeare did this a lot too, this is a when, 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 then construction of a sonnet. Do you see it? When I have fears, when I behold, right? When I feel, then, on the shore of the white world, I stand on it. Do you see it? When I, when, 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 then, construction. I do all of this, by the way, as a mnemonic to help you remember, so that when you get to the exam and you got questions over this poem, you have some sense of it. Of course, if you memorize this poem, it'll help you even more. All right, let's take a look at it. What is it that Keats, roughly the age 20, what is it that Keats wants to accomplish but is sad he won't accomplish before he dies. Let's take them in order. When I have fears that I may cease to be before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain. What does that mean? Write it down in your own words. What's the first thing that he's bummed about? I'm going to die before I do what? Before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain. What does that mean? All of his thoughts written down. It bummed, it bummed him out that he would not be able to write everything that was in his brain down before he died. That really made him sad. Before high-piled books in character, whole like rich garners, the full ripened grain. I'll give you an insight to this one. Keats grew up with poor health. He was the kid who never got to go outside for P.E. They would send him to the library. It's a sad word picture. 
that in his elementary years, there he is in a library looking out the window at the kids outside playing cricket or soccer or whatever. He can't do it physically. He's too, like, he's too uh, weak. So he learns how to read. But when he starts coughing up blood, he says every time he walked in front of a library or he walked into a room with books, it was like all the books were laughing at him because he realized how many books he wouldn't be able to read because he was soon to die. And it bugged him. Notice the word picture here is, it's like those grain fields that you see out north of town in July. You know how they go in and then they harvest all that grain? His word picture is that all of the ideas in books are like all that grain. And it really bums him out. He's going to die with whole fields uncut. In other words, what? Put it in your own words. What's he bummed about? I'm not going to be able to write enough before I go. And then what's the second one? I'm not going to be able to, what? Read enough, right? Read enough before I go. It's funny for us, some of us who hate reading, to think that this is where he would go. But maybe for us, it's a different kind of thing. It's a different kind of viewing, maybe we would say. When I behold upon the night starred face, huge cloudy symbols of a high romance and think that I may never live to trace their magic with the shadow, their shadows with the magic hand of chance. Wait a minute, don't get caught up in the word romance too quickly. We'll get to the girl and talk about Keats and the love life here in a moment. In this passage here, we're not so much interested in romance as in falling in love, but the key here is when I behold upon the night's starred face. What are we talking about and what is it romantic poets are always into? With a capital N as well as with a small N, huh? Good, let's write it down. This is the next thing. He says, I'm bummed out about all the places I'm never going to get to see. All the, th all the places I wanted to see and I'm never going to get to see. He wasn't a traveler because he, didn't, he wasn't raised with money. Unlike Wordsworth, he could pretty much go see anything he wanted because he had bank. Keats doesn't have the advantage of that. And to that degree, the only place he ever got to see other than his, you know, England was Italy. And by that point... Of course, some students have said, it'd be awfully hard to know if I was going to be dead in May to go touring places. You know what I mean? Because there would be something bittersweet about that. Yes, I am walking along the Great Wall of China, but I, I won't ever get to do this again because I'm about to go. See what I mean? There's something kind of bummed about that. And this happened for Keats even going to the great city of Rome. Uh-oh, and now we'll get to the third one. And when I feel fair creature of an hour that I shall never look upon thee more. Uh-oh, let's say this one. Keats does have a girl. She loves him. She loves him. Her dad says no. Because Keats has no bank. And during this time, right, a guy's got to have some money or the, or the girl's family isn't going to let her marry the guy. And so she says to Keats, I love you. But dad says no because you've got no bank. You've got no money. So Keats is like, well, I'll start, I'll make some money. And then he starts coughing up blood. Yeah, see, Harder just kind of goes dark, dark, ironic laugh about that, right? It's like, it cra right, right, uh, there it is. That sucks. Huh? So take a look at what he says. And when I feel fair creature of an hour, his girl, that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love. So let's put it back together now. It's a simple sonnet, isn't it? When I know I'm going to die before I've read enough books, before I've written enough stuff, before I've traveled and seen the world, when I feel like I'm really sad that I'm not going to be able to look at my girl anymore. When all of those things happen to me, he says, what is it that he does? Well, let's take a look after the dash. Then, he's playing a word picture here. Let's talk about it. Then on the shore of the wide world... I stand alone and think to love and fame to nothingness to sink. What? I don't understand. What's the word picture that he says? He says, when I get really bummed about the fact that I'm going to die before I can do all those things I listed. He says, what I do is I go out to the shore of the wide world and I stand alone and think to love and fame to nothingness to sink. <coughs> Metaphorically, he says, I go out to the edge of the universe and I look back at the world and I'm reminded that two things do not matter. Love 
and fame. And then I somehow can kind of live with the insanity of it all, that i got to die. How do you know that of those two things, love and fame, one of those he was never able to let go of? Mr. Durant, how do we know that? Well, what did he put on his tombstone? Right? Here lies one whose name was red in water, tells us that when he died, he was still bummed out about what? Never getting fame. Right, never getting fame. What's ironic about that fact? Yeah, we're talking about him now, aren't we? See, he's gone. He has no clue that we're talking about him, unless, of course, you believe in afterlife and that kind of thing, right? And, of course, if you believe in that, Keats is going, oh, well, I guess I did okay then. Yeah, he did better than okay. As a matter of fact, he did so well that he has accorded one of the greatest poems in the English language. It's on page 866. You could make the argument that few poems are as analyzed and as anthologized as this poem. Now, one of the reasons why I spend so much time with you working through a poem like Ten Turn Abbey is that if you can get through Ten Turn Abbey, you can get through a poem like Ode on a Grecian Urn, okay? You've already seen a couple of odes. The other word we used was what? Apostrophe. So now we're going to come to Keats' famous ode. He wrote several of these odes. This is the most famous. And what we would say about this poem is that it demands a little bit of background knowledge. So let's get ready to take a few notes. We'll finish reading this poem. We'll begin the exegesis process. And then we'll come back tomorrow to finish for exam prep. Keats loved to go to a special historical museum in London. He was told about a new exhibit that had just arrived, brought back to England by a cat named Elgin, E-L-I-G-N. This guy was a Indiana Jones, if you know that guy. This Elgin guy was one of those guys. He was an archaeologist. He was a treasure seeker. He was a finder of treasures. What he did is he went to Greece. Under cover of night, he took a whole bunch of stuff and he stuck it on his boat and brought it back home to England. He stole it from the Greeks. He got up on the Parthenon and actually started cutting reliefs right off of that, that magnificent structure in Athens. Well, how'd the Greeks feel about this? To this day, they are still torqued about it. To this day, they are still trying to get this stuff back. England keeps saying things like, yeah, 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 we're thinking about it still. To this day, right? Those marbles, those reliefs, those finds came back to England and were displayed. And they're today even still known as the Elgin Marbles, okay? Keats loved to go and take a look at these, at these uh, findings from ancient Greece, okay? Uh, one of the findings was a, an urn. So let's define that in your notes. The way they displayed this thing, by the way, was on a circular uh, kind of a pedestal. So you could sit in one place and it would turn slowly so you could see all the way around it. So you didn't even have to walk around the display. You could just look at it. Now, what is an urn? Well, it's kind of like a... Does anyone know what an urn is? It's like a vase. Yeah, it's like a vase. Yeah, it's like a big vase. What's it for? Does anyone know? Ashes. Well, I don't understand ashes. What does that mean? Like if you're... Like grand right, right. In other words, you die, you go on a funeral pyre, your body is burned, your ashes are collected, and then they're put inside of this urn, and that urn then is kind of held as sacred. Now, the Greeks would not only create these urn of clay, right, if you've been in art class where you had to do this thing where you spin it and then you have to heat it and everything, but they would also decorate the outside of the urn. Got me? So what happens is that one of these urns is brought back. It's very ancient. It's old, right? It's an old, old urn. I mean, at the point when Keats is looking at it, remember we're in roughly 1800. That means 800 years after the birth of Christ. The Greeks are roughly 500 years before the birth of Christ. So you can kind of get a sense of the amount of time we're talking about. Easily over 1,500 years, this urn, this work of art, kind of set under the ground or hidden out of sight. And then it's brought back, and now it's displayed. Keats is going to look at this thing, and we're told that he spent a lot of time studying it. He was mesmerized by the fact that some unknown artist had sat down, created this urn, died, 
And then 1,500 years later, the urn is sitting in front of him. And he's kind of mesmerized by the power of art in this regards. And he writes this famous poem called Ode on a Grecian Urn. What does Grecian mean? Overrelated to Greek, right? It came from the Greek <laughs> culture. Now, I want to point out a couple of things at 2B before we read this poem together. Notice, first of all, this poem is divided up into parts. Do you see that? So, for example, you have parts, or what we could call stanzas. Do you see it? One, two, three all appear on page 866. Four, five appear on 867. Do you see it? About each one of these parts, we want to ask, like we wanted to ask about another ode, right? Which had how many parts? Seven. How many parts did Ode to the West Wind have? Remember? It had five as well, didn't it? And when Shelley drowns, he has whose poetry in his pocket? Okay, right? So there's a, there's a certain kind of con contiguity at play here the, in terms of these poets. So you've got a five stanza poem, and about each one of these stanzas, we want to ask a simple question. What does Keats say about this urn that he's looking at. He's going to speak directly to it, which is why it's an ode. All right. And then we'll pay attention especially to the final two lines of the poem. Is Let's go ahead and... I'm sorry, say it again. Is there someone in the urn or no? Uh, that, uh, that is a good question. There's no ashes in the urn anymore, although it's, it was evident that it had been used as such right before. Um, Keats is so much more interested in what's on the outside of the urn as in what's drawn. And as you sit, you look at it turn, there are these scenes that are described. He's going to tell us what they kind of look like. Let's go ahead. With that bit of background now, the poem can make some sense. Let's at least read the poem together. Some of you report that as we read this stuff out loud, it starts to make more sense. Suggestion. You start reading it out loud on your own in your own study. See how well it works for you, okay? Ode on a Grecian urn. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time, sylvan historian, who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme? What leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both in Tempe or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loathe? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and trembles, what wild ecstasy. Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore ye soft pipes play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared, pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. Fair youth beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold <coughs> lover, Never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near the goal. Yet do not grieve, she cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss. Forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy boughs, that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu. And happy melodists, unwearied, forever piping songs, forever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love. Forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting and forever young. All breathing human passion far above, that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leads thou that heifer lowing at the skies, and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? What little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is empty to this folk, this pious morn? And, little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can e'er return. O attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought. With forest branches and the trodden weed, thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity, cold pastoral. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man, to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth. 